Hello, and welcome back to Geek Out with Perry. I'm Julia White, your new host, along with Perry, of course. Now, some of our exchange loyalists may wonder why we've been off the air for so long. Well, as it turns out, we had to track down Perry, who was locked up in his lab, perfecting his exchange server pillow. And now that that's done, we used a few MacGyver tactics, and we got him out of the lab and back here in the studio. So Perry, it's great to have you back. I want to spend today's session talking about security and privacy. It's a really hot topic with all the customers I speak with, and they really want to understand how we run a secure and private service with Office 365. And it feels like, too, I get a lot of questions very specifically about encryption. And customers are maybe thinking that encryption is a silver bullet for making sure there's security and privacy in the service. So that's what I want to ask you. Is that the silver bullet? Encryption isn't everything. It is absolutely foundational to building a secure service. Okay. But there's an awful lot of things you need to build on top of data that's encrypted at rest and data that's encrypted in flight. And okay. those fundamental promises are part of our service offering. Okay. And are necessary components of building a fully secure offering. But when you start uh, going through building a large scale service, it turns yeah. out you have to build a lot of different data centers in different places. Mm -hmm. You know, first of all, you got physical regions you want to get to, uh, and those regions are getting more granular with time so that we can provide guarantees of where your data is local to the geography you need it to be uh, contained in. Okay. But even within regions, uh, single countries, there'll be multiple data centers, and you need many multiple data centers, both because of the scale of the system and because mm -hmm. of the need to provide redundancy. Right, all right? within the same region. Right. And then within a data center, these just miles and miles of racks are filled with servers and disk drives on them. Um, so there is all this potential for all these physical uh, containment units, yeah. right? And one of the things I think that uh, is important is to think through what that model is for containment and isolation and build that into the system and kind of take advantage of some of those boundaries you're going to have anyway. Hmm. Um, and we think about these things from the perspective, from a security perspective is, there's a set of physical containers like servers, racks, data centers, and you want to have okay. boundaries around those. If I need to do some operations on Exchange ActiveSync, you can think of that as an opportunity for a logical boundary between those operations and the operations that involve um, uh, a calendar service. Okay. Okay. Uh, so you can think about uh, the physical containers, the logical boundaries, and then there's the time boundary, which is, uh, you should only need access for short periods of time mm -hmm. and any individual, and most of the time, you shouldn't have any access to anything. Got it. Okay? You're talking about the people running our That's service. Right. right. Okay. So you can sort of think of this set as what we normally talk of as roles-based access control and the uh, system here. The okay. time thing is about workflows that guarantee that any elevation uh, for somebody to get uh, access mm -hmm. to almost anything requires another human being and is tracked. And you start with no access and you get access for a limited amount of time and it's automatically taken away. Okay. That access is limited to a very small set of verbs that largely will only enable you to do the precise set of things you need to do, mm. okay? And you have been pre-approved after all the background checks on you, mm -hmm. right? And your role and what you need to do so that there's only a set of things you can be approved into okay. after you go through a workflow. Also, you only have access to subsets of data. It's a particular server, a particular mm -hmm. rack, uh, certainly not multiple data centers and all the rest of it. Okay. Okay. So that's a set of things that we think is, needs to be deeply built into. And to make these things work requires two things. One is it doesn't work unless the data that's sitting there is at encrypted at rest. Okay. Right. So every byte needs yeah. to be that's got interesting data in it needs to be encrypted, because if you don't have that, then just physical access to a data center starts giving you massive mm -hmm. access to all the data on these on these disk drives if you manage to go through and start copying them off. It, when it's encrypted, that allows you to have a an atom on which you can build uh, logical controls on top of it. So for Exchange Online, do we yeah. have encryption at rest? Yes. Great. Okay. Same thing goes with uh, the network, right? If the bits on the flying on the wire aren't encrypted, mm -hmm. then uh, you can put in choke points between the data centers and look at all the traffic. Now, you might need to build it up over time. It's hard to look at the history in many cases, but you could imagine organizations uh, then taking advantage of the fact that the data in flight, where they could get access to it, yep. is visible. Um, okay. So data encryption at rest, data encryption in flight are, are key parts of building a system, but far from sufficient. Okay. And then I think there's another key point, which is about 
this idea of functional footprint. By far the biggest exposure is individuals that are compromised mm -hmm. in an organization mm -hmm. or somehow their credentials get compromised. Okay. So one of the key questions is, let's say somebody within your organization is compromised or their credentials have been compromised. How much can they expand their scope okay. once they've got access to that? Yep. It's really hard for them to expand their scope because they need to talk to another human being and they go, you're not Joe. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, and you're asking for something that's very odd mm -hmm. because there's no reason for you to be doing that right now. Okay. Okay. So these are very important things. Yeah. But another key thing is things fail at scale and we are working against people who are uh, thinking hard about things. Right. One of the key questions is there's just a set of things you just can't do in the service because... Compromise is about using your credentials to get access to the tools. Okay. You know, yeah. somebody who breaks in doesn't come in and then start writing reams and reams of code nope. to take advantage of stuff. And some of the things they want to do requires very complex operations. Mm -hmm. Usually the tools are there. <laughs> so limiting the set of functions and making sure the functions are tied to the needs of the customer is a key point about being able to do some interesting guarantees about data transparency and data protections. Um, and that's something that uh, we talk to, are talking to customers quite a bit about our ability to provide guarantees about third party discovery operations uh, and making sure that there's a rock solid guarantee that they mm -hmm. can't do that without the permission of our customer. Got it. Okay. So essentially, there's these boundaries, but if someone did somehow get compromised, even right. what they're capable of doing is very limited in scope. Right. If you build that system <laughs> so that there's a set of things that just can't be done, right, right, uh, without a customer approval workflow, for instance, because the yeah. engine only works that way, mm -hmm. it becomes much more difficult if the customer decides, I'm never going to approve those workflows right. for anybody to compromise it. Yeah. I wouldn't be able to compromise it. Mm -hmm. The government wouldn't be able to compromise it. They would actually have to go to the customer because it's the way the system's built. And that's a lot of the concern I hear from customers is they want to have that ultimate control. And so it sounds like that's, that's right. And and it, this provides two things. It gives you a, this system plus this will give you a very deep understanding of mm -hmm. who has access when mm -hmm. and what happened. Okay. And we can provide that data to customers. Got it. We think this investment is much deeper than any of our customers are doing today in their data centers. Absolutely. So right. one of the things when people should think about it is, there's no, never such thing as zero risk, but mm -hmm. the question is, are you lowering your risk by the going to the cloud? And I think at this point, the technology is getting to the point where it's pretty clear we can yeah. uh, lower the risk. Yep. Now there's a couple of stuff that people talk about when they're just talking about uh, encryption. One of the most common meme that keeps coming up is this idea of searchable encryption. Another, we call that as an attempt to have opaque right. storage. Yeah, right? and if I hear someone say they think they can get encryption and all the user experience benefits. That's right. right. I mean, uh, it, is definitely the, the, it is definitely possible to put content into Office 365 that is completely opaque to us. Yep. We provide mechanisms so they can pick pieces of content that are particularly sensitive and have it completely opaque to us. Opaque to us as the, as the vendor. It's fully encrypted end to end. We never see the keys. It is guaranteed. Okay. We can't have access and we can't leak it. Right. Um, but there's certain things that don't work when you do that. Mm -hmm. uh, search indexes that need to scan through the content, of course, can't build those, those indexes. Great. Okay. So, 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 the there user are, experience so there are some people yeah. who are saying, hey, I can give you something called circle, searchable encryption that builds on top of the system. And mm -hmm. we're pretty convinced this is the definition of an oxymoron. You can have either search and functionality that looks at the content okay. and analyzes it. And increasingly, that's one of the values of these services is the right. analytics and business intelligence you can do on the server that makes people more productive. Mm -hmm. Or you can have completely opaque end-to-end -end encryption. Got it. But the nature of search means that any searchable encryption scheme is really just an obfuscation system. Mm. And anybody who's got any skills at all will find it is a very trivial exercise to uh, break the obfuscation. It's certainly not encryption by any stretch. And when it now is no longer searchable, yeah. like what are the key things that users can't do? Search my inbox? Yes. Um, and there's going to be more things, like it'll be tougher for us to decide this is an important message mm -hmm. uh, and make sure that that gets yeah. your attention earlier. So any of the new pro proactive value add capabilities would that's, be that's correct. as well. And increasingly, that's where people are going with this stuff. Yep, absolutely. There's another set of things that are here that people keep talking about, which is, hey, it's great you've got it encrypted at rest. I think it'd be really valuable for us to control the keys. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and we think that it does have value. It's okay. not like this. This is this does have value. But people should be clear about what the value is. Mm. And really, this is about revocation. 
when you own the keys and things are encrypted and yeah. you share them with us mm -hmm. and we have a contract with you in which you can take away the keys, it immediately makes all that data that's in our system no, completely opaque to us. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. It will also largely break the service when you do that. The user experience. For that data. Yeah. Okay. But it can be a valuable thing to be able to do revocation. Mm -hmm. When but, would a customer want to do that? Just for right. an example. So people are often thinking about this in the context of this is a way I can protect myself against third-party subpoenas. Okay. Okay. The so problem they can with, hold the keys if they want to. That's right. The problem with that is it requires being pre-warned of the need to do revocation. Okay. And since the implications of doing it are large, it's unlikely they're going to do it unless they're very, very sure something's mm -hmm. about to happen. Mm -hmm. And often people are very interested in this blind thing. So it doesn't really protect on the blind subpoena problem. Right. In fact, really... In that case, it's just delete. And the degree to which you can trust us to execute the delete command it should be the degree to which you can trust us to delete the keys. Interesting. Give me more. What do you mean by delete? Well, if you say, for this scope, for this mailbox, yep. please hard delete everything. Get rid of it. Now. Okay. Okay. Today, it is not possible to delete everything in our system within seconds and hard delete it, mm -hmm. right? We have Good data reasons. protection right. systems that allow us to make sure that we don't delete stuff because of mistakes. Yep. So revocation is a way of implementing a delete mm -hmm. that doesn't actually touch the data and is undoable a Got little it. bit, okay. okay? So, and that's kind of the story that is about customer owned keys here. Okay. And we do think that has value and that is an area that we will invest in making sure that that kind of thing. Now, Perry, this is great, and we've talked a lot about what's kind of built into the service, and actually, let me flip over to help recap a little bit. Um, kind of built in that everyone benefits from when how we run the, a secure and private service, right? But we also know that a large percentage of data loss is actually based on the user, not the system. So, you, you know, a user sending an email out or some content out, either unintended oftentimes or sometimes maliciously. So what do we do within the service that customers control that type of data loss? Right. Well, certainly once the rise of the machines is complete, things will be a lot simpler. And, um, but in the meantime, when uh, things are more interesting yeah. um, and fun, uh, you know, there needs to be a lot of investment in thinking through the risk profile that a company's facing holistically. And okay. again, it's about you have to do work that generates mm -hmm. stuff and it, that stuff is valuable and that creates issues about how you share it effectively yep. and sharing creates risk. It's okay. got to be written down somewhere. It's clearly got to be unencrypted for human beings to read it. So mm -hmm. inherent in the process of being productive is this risk of being that productivity being exposed in ways you don't want it. All um, right. So uh, one of the key places that we've invested heavily is data loss protection. Right, DLP, yep. Which is about, in fact, guiding in the context of their work, mm -hmm. uh, giving people the right hints and the right tools so that they can make good decisions about whether or not they're going to share valuable company information okay. with a broader set of people that are outside of the, the company and they don't want to do that and they just know or guaranteeing that the content that there is in the mail, mm -hmm. you know, everybody's experienced the issue of, of a thread that's had a number of replies, yeah. and there's an email at the very base that had somebody's personal information in it, okay. and you forget that that was there. Yep. Um, so this is a way that the machinery can actually inform you, no, 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 you forgot. Mm -hmm. There's somebody's social insurance number in this mail, and you go, right. Okay, so this is where we talk about like mail tips, kind of a lightweight, but then the new policy tips with Exchange Online. That's right. And the user actually gets a little notification that says, hey, you're about right. to send something confidential. Right. Great. Okay. Okay. And then email is an incredibly powerful thing because it allows people to communicate around the planet. And Absolutely. most people have addresses and it's a very democratic system. But at the core of it, it was always an open system. Mm -hmm. And messages that went between systems weren't always encrypted. Right. Uh, so we've made a big investment here yeah. uh, to make sure that you can communicate with your customers or th other parties and make yeah. sure that the content is guaranteed to be uh, readable at the other end, mm -hmm. but make sure that in flight across many different systems and third-party systems, it still has, it's encrypted in flight. Okay. And okay. this is the Office 365 message encryption where I can encrypt anything to anyone kind of. Correct. Ad hoc encryption. Right. Great. Okay. okay. Uh, there are cases when the need for 
being very secure about certain pieces of content mm -hmm. is uh, important. Yep. And RMS enables companies to be able to pick the set of content they really truly want to make opaque mm -hmm. and make sure that that is never in the clear outside of the of very tight boundaries that they, they can set. Okay. okay, and that's our so right, man, right management services. That's correct. So it says things like you can't forward, I can't print, right. you can't send, all of that. Okay? Right. And then finally is this idea of different people have different ways they need to work mm -hmm. and uh, making sure that they have the access to the content they need where they need it, Yeah. but not necessarily access to things where they don't need it. So for certain companies, it's very important to be highly mobile. Yeah. In other companies and organizations, it's very important for certain content to and certain people to never access uh, things outside of certain boundaries. And one of the ways you can do that is by restricting access at uh, the user level to mm -hmm. various uh, operations or protocols. Okay, so uh, that's, so that's something that IT sets and says certain users have certain capabilities and they can control all of that. That's right. And Great. One of the, the nice things about Office 365 is this all gets deployed and managed and maintained for you and becomes a very cost-effective way of making sure that you have access to mm -hmm. all of these tools without buying and cobbling together right. a bunch of different solutions that may not work very well together and often ends up being a very expensive Absolutely. Uh, thing to implement. It's the idea. It's all built in. It's ne not bolted on. It's one Correct. comprehensive system. Perfect. Well, Perry, that was great. I mean, I feel like I've gotten a lot better sense of both what we've built into the security, at, or built into the service, sorry, at the security and privacy, but also kind of the capabilities that our customers have to add on based on their own unique personal uh, company profiles, essentially. Right. And I think one of the interesting conversations I had with customers is the eye-opening moment when they realize when they're talking to their data protection, security mm. people, and they're yeah. very worried about going to the cloud. Yeah. And they and they say, okay, and then we mentioned that, hey, we haven't deployed this, we haven't deployed this, we haven't deployed this, we haven't deployed this, right. because we can't move to the next version, you guys don't want to fund it. Right. And when you look at all this, this is much more important about actually lowering the risk to the company right. than worrying about whether or not um, uh, we are doing background checks as well as sure. the cloud providers are on the staff that's in the data center. Sure. But this is the strategic thing to focus on. Makes sense. Now, if you want to hear more of this type of conversation, as well as hang out with Perry, or folks from the Exchange and Office 365 team, the thing for you to do is to go to the Exchange Conference, MEC. And it's running from March 31st to April 2nd in lovely Austin, Texas. The way to do that is go to immech.com and register today. Are you seriously wearing your Mac 2012 wristband, dude? That is crazy.